Well, we have a wonderful group gathered here to worship, and for those of you who are online, we thank you for being with us today. You know, it uh, is a very special day because in the book of Romans, chapter 13 and verse 7, it says, give respect to whom respect is due. Give honor to whom honor is due. And there's no doubt that that's true about leaders and politics and positions of importance in our community and our state and in our country. But how much more important is it for us to give respect and honor within our families? So we want to say this morning, Happy Mother's Day. And as we think about Mother's Day and the influence of mothers, I can't help but think about an Old Testament woman who helps us to see that motherly influence at work. I believe it's a powerful force. You know, over in Great Britain, they have a new uh, submarine that's pretty powerful. It's the Astute Class Submarine. Did you know that it will go for 25 years? 25 years. Now, they'll have to come get some food, I believe, some, somewhere along the line. But as far as, as the energy and the power that drives that new sub, it's utterly amazing. But I don't think a nuclear submarine is the most powerful force in the world, despite the engine that drives it, the, the fuel that makes it possible, or the payload that it can deliver. But instead, I think really the most powerful force in the world is a mother. I think about the love that fuels her heart, not for 25 years, but uh, for 50 or 75 or more years. It reminds me of that burning bush with Moses. You know, it just kept burning and it wouldn't go out. That that love just continues to fuel all kinds of sacrifices and loving behaviors on the part of, of so many. And so it is not only powerful, but it's positive. You know, you think about that submarine, it, it may be kind of scary, even horrific, to think about its ability to destroy. But instead of horrific, we have mothers with this holy love which is a positive and a constructive force that changes our world and makes it better. I think, without question, we could talk about a lot of powerful things in this world, but nothing, I don't think anything, can compare to a mother's love. And I think about Deborah, who in the Old Testament, in the book of Judges, in the fourth chapter, we know that she was a mother in Israel. And her example has always inspired me. She's an interesting woman, isn't she? Because we have all of these judges. But we have this singular woman who stands out because of the patriarchal age in which she lived. In that period, from Joshua, the successor of Moses, going over to the time of Saul, who was followed by David and Solomon, over to the time of the monarchy. In between there, we have this period of judges. And she was one of these judges. And they were, they were powerful leaders. But she was the singular woman in that group. An exception, a notable exception. When you think about Deborah, it says that she was a prophetess. And we know that even in the New Testament, the Bible talks about there are prophetesses that were a part of the first century and the establishment of the church. You know, one thing that tells me is that she was a godly woman, that God selected her and uh, allowed her to communicate his will in special ways on special occasions. We don't know how that gift of prophecy was exercised on a continual basis. We know that there are times that God communicated particular events 
It wasn't necessarily uh, constant and ongoing. But in the, in the time of need, God would communicate to the nation through this woman. We also know that she was, as we said, a judge. And a judge during that period would hear some difficult cases that were a little harder than the average that the local people who would hear such cases might have difficulty with. But they were more than just a judge. They were also national leaders. And she was a military leader as well. So a prophetess, she was godly. A judge, well, she was wise. She was wise in discerning those cases. She could handle those enigmas, but she could also deal with enemies. And the idea of a woman serving in that capacity was not conventional. It was unusual. But God used her in that capacity. She was courageous. Absolutely courageous. Fearless because of what? Her faith in God. Makes me think about a mother, godly and discerning, very wise, and fearless going about that task, courageous because of faith in God. And one other thing, it's just that, that motherly instinct was definitely a part of what made her such a positive force in the lives of many. Now, when you think of those qualities, godly and, and discerning, wise, courageous, and tender, nurturing, we, we understand that Deborah was both capable and she was confident. That's a good quality as you lead your life. Can a, can a woman be confident without being inappropriate. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I think that's something that to many of us as men made our wives attractive to us. She was industrious. She wore a lot of hats, didn't she? How about your mother? How about your wife wearing a lot of hats and adaptive to whatever circumstance arose that needed to be dealt with? And she was equal, but different. When I think about these things, I can't help but, but think about the book of Proverbs. When you go to Proverbs chapter 31, you know where I'm going. It talks about the virtuous woman. And I see these same qualities in Deborah. It says, beginning in verse 10, An excellent wife who can find. She's far more precious than jewels. Very rare, very valuable. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good, not harm, all the days of her life. Here's the industry. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant and brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. There's the tenderness and the caring heart. She considers a field and buys it. She's discerning. And with the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength. Here's the confidence. And makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hand to the distaff and her Hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She brings respect to the family. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. 
Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. And I can't help but think that Deborah brings all of these qualities to the forefront. Capable, yes. Confident, yes. Industrious, yes. Adaptive, yes. Wise, yes. Courageous, yes. Absolutely. She is indeed a virtuous woman. But now let's think about this last point. Equal, but different. You know, over in uh, Paul's writings, you find him discussing this subject. Paul said men and women are equal. In the book of Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, For in Christ Jesus you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Let me have a hearty amen, okay? Amen. We believe in the necessity, the essentiality of baptism, but who is it for? It is for all with faith. Now the next verse says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there is neither male, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't think that's calling for transgender bathrooms or transgender competition in the Olympics. I think what it's saying is that when it comes to our standing before God, that women are in no way inferior to men. In no way inferior to men. So that we come to God through faith, through repentance, through confession, through baptism, And we are heirs together of the grace of God. Amen. Amen. But Paul also designated some unique roles for women. Equal, yes. But different, yes. Let me share uh, some passages with you that I think will help us to understand this. So, number one... We think about Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 22 through 24 where it talks about men and women in the uh, domestic arrangement of marriage. And here's what it says, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body is and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. So there is a submissive quality and a domestic quality. Over the book of Titus, we read in the book of Titus in chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, older women... Likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They're to teach what is good and so train by their example as well as their instruction and so train the young women to love their husbands. Don't despise your husband. Love your husband and children to be self-controlled pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Another quality is maternal. In the book of 1 Timothy, we read in chapter 2, and uh, going down through verse 15, Let me just begin here in verse 11. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. 
For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. I think in part the fulfillment of that verse is found in the fact that Mary bore our Savior, Jesus Christ. That God used woman to bring the Savior of the world to us. But I think there is a lesser sense in which we can think in a practical way that godly mothers are the salvation of our country. We're not talking about uh, the, the salvation from our past sins. That comes through Christ and through His blood. But what gives any hope for the future? It's faithful families. It is godly mothers who are fulfilling the will of God by carrying out a very unique role in the home and respectful. I just wanted to show you, it's not just Paul. Sometimes people talk about Paul uh, just being uh, patriarchal and you know, Paul spoke by inspiration and his message was confirmed by other apostles like Peter. And so we go over to 1 Peter chapter 3 and what do we read Peter telling us? He says in 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 1, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your your, your adorning, your primary adornment, what should that be? The hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty doesn't go away of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious, very precious. Now, when you look at that list, what is he saying? Is he saying that a woman should never have an independent thought, or if she does, she should never express it? That's not what he's saying. Is he saying that you have to get married? He's, I don't think that's what he's saying, that you have to have children. I don't think that's what he's saying. But he's laying down some principles that, that are a blessing to our families and our society that that as you get married, and as you have children, that these are, are not lesser things. But that your devotion to God is seen in your loving devotion to your spouse and to your kids. So don't be a busybody. Don't just gallivant around the globe or the community. Take care of business. Take care of what really matters. Make sure you keep first things first. When I think about Deborah, I think she was as a mother in Israel, as the wife of Lapidoth. I think that she had to have been an encourager to her children. It reminds me of of 2 Timothy, when Paul talks about Timothy's grandmother, do you remember her name? Lois. And his mother, what was her name? It was that beautiful name, Eunice. Eunice. The faith that was in Timothy dwelt first in his grandmother and in his mother. And so we want to, by our example, as it said for the older women teaching the younger women, that it is using your influence to encourage that next generation 
that needs not only to hear but to see. Needs to see what faith in God looks like. What discipleship, devotion to following Jesus looks like. Or, we remember Deborah encouraged men. She did. In the fourth chapter of Judges, it talks about Jabin, the king of Hazor. These, these Canaanite rulers oppressing Israel for 20 years. For 20 years, particularly these uh, north-central tribes. And everyone was afraid because he had the latest in military equipment, not a nuclear submarine, but 900 chariots. And the captain of the chariots was a man by the name of Sisera. And just the mention of his name struck fear into people's hearts. I guess it was like saying Rommel back in World War II. So we know that this oppression was going on, but the prophetess, here's the case where God revealed his message to the people. What happened? God used her to communicate to Barak it was time to summon an army. Now, when she talked to Barak, he was hesitant. And he said, well, I don't know about this. But if you'll accompany me, I'll go. And sometimes the encouragement, the nudging, the prodding of a good woman can help men step up in areas of responsibility that are needful. And Barak should have done this himself. In fact, he lost the credit for the victory because he did not have the courage to step out but needed to lean upon her. But there she was. There she was. To encourage him. It was Deborah who gave the command to, to engage the enemy and to go into battle. She gave encouragement to Barak. I know that I would not be who I am today without the encouragement of Lisa, who sometimes looked past who I was and loved the man she knew I could be and helped me. Now, it's not that she despised the, the man that she married, but she had these, this wisdom and this discernment to see the future before it arrived. She saw qualities in me that I couldn't even see in myself and brought them to the surface. Well, Deborah encouraged them, and God fought with them, and God brought a storm, and there was a great victory. And the, the enemy, you know, this battle, they gathered at Mount Tabor, and when they gathered at Mount Tabor, the people assembled. God brought this storm that made those chariots worthless because they would get mired in the mud or washed away by a flash flood, and the Israelites routed their enemy. But it came through the encouragement of Deborah. I think about Deborah's encouragement of some of her sisters, like Jael. Where did Jael get the courage when Sisera was fleeing and he sought refuge and he was in her tent? Where did she get the courage to engage herself in the battle? To end the life of their enemy. My guess it was kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were encouraged by Daniel. And that, that Jael had to have received some courage from the example of Deborah. And so, of all the things that make Old Hickory a great place to call home, there's none greater than our women's ministry. None greater. I think about our classes and our ladies' lunches and our service projects. I think about our summer series coming up, a call to joy. Sisters encouraging sisters. Important business. Important business. And then there is the encouragement of the community. You know, the whole country was inspired. It's amazing because here we have the Canaanite uh, king and this great military commander 
And everybody is terrified. And here is a woman ready to withstand because of her faith in God. And when the call went out, you know what happened? The people came. Thousands and thousands came. They poured out of nearly every tribe. Even the Transjordan, they were coming over to engage in the battle. The country was rallied and inspired and motivated. And you know, that's part of what we ought to do. Is we ought to give hope at our workplace, hope in our schools, hope in our communities. There's a lot of things wrong. But we can also encourage because we believe in the power of God. So when we look at this woman, I think there's a message here for all women. And that is that the softer side of leadership is no less needful and it's no less powerful. In fact, in many ways, isn't it more powerful? A mother's love. So when you look at uh, this, Paul was encouraged. Encouraged when he thought about the power of a mother's love. He found it so compelling that when he wanted to communicate how much he cared for the Thessalonians, he says, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Paul was moved by the figure. And I think it ought to inspire all of us. So let's think about Deborah. Was Deborah a feminist? Was she an anarchist, throwing all authority to the wind? Was she an opportunist, trying to step up just for her own welfare and benefit? You know what it says after they won that victory against Jabin and Sisera was gone and the chariots had been annihilated? You know what it says? They had rest for 40 years. Isn't that amazing? Think of what happened because it doesn't say that they had a protest movement for 40 years because she had come to liberate women from all male authority. It doesn't talk about that. It doesn't talk about 40 years of civil unrest and this was just the beginning of it. You know, when you think about Deborah, it doesn't tell us about her home life. It doesn't tell us about her behavior in religious assemblies. Some people want to take this example, and we see that in social ways, she was not conventional. In secular responsibilities, she stepped up to positions that were not the normal thing. But that doesn't mean that in the spiritual things, that the spiritual things were set aside. Let me give you an example. Think about Saul, the first, the first king of Israel. He's king. Does that mean he can do anything that he wants, throw off any kind of authority? What happened when he tried to do something religiously that he had not been authorized to do? He's the king. And he lost the kingdom. And he lost the confidence of God's people because he stepped beyond his role and the boundaries that God had put in place. So were there exceptions in social matters? Yes, there were. But then there are exclusive instructions that God gives in certain spiritual matters. And those ought to be observed. So Deborah... You know, she wasn't anti-male. She wasn't anti-authority. When you think about her, she was a tireless servant. She was just out there going about doing good, being a blessing. She was a constant encourager. And so I want to say thank you to the ladies who are here today. Thanks. And I didn't finish Proverbs 31, did I? Let's go back for one second to Proverbs 31. Because I want to read the ending. I want to remind you of what it says at the close. 
After all of her accomplishments, achievements, activities, here's what it says. Verse 28. Her children. Rise up and call her blessed. That's our study in the Beatitudes. Blessed. Her husband also. Also what? Calls her blessed. And he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. And beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. I think your contributions, your actions praise you, but this morning we want to praise you. We want to say thank you, ladies. Thank you, moms, in-laws, Miss Marge. Thank you for my sweet Lisa. Thank you, grandmothers. We love you, we respect you, we honor you, we appreciate you. But as much as we love Deborah and her encouraging example, who is it that we find the most encouragement from? It is Jesus, who didn't count it a quality with God, a thing to be grasped, but instead made himself a servant and lived that beautiful, humble, holy life to inspire all of us to live by the same pattern. So I want to encourage you today. You want more joy? You want more opportunities to glorify God? Then you need to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ and come in faith, confessing Jesus as the divine Son of God and be buried, buried with Christ in baptism. Will you repent? Will you be baptized? Do you need prayer this morning. If we can help you, we want to encourage you to come as we stand and sing.